Good evening to everyone and welcome to today's wonderful evening. Aapke farmaish for the NEED PG 2019 with all of you. Sweetie, Amrit, Jaswinder, Ashok, Commandant, Ranjit and many more. Jaise patake ke sound nikalta hai bahar. Aapka answers, right answers also should come out in the NEET PG 2019. And next year, Diwali, you should be the junior resident year one in medicine, surgery, gynops, orthopedics, pediatrics, etc, etc. So I wish and I love to give my luck to all of you also to crack the NEET PG 2019. So let's make the great beginning. Can you please punch whether the voice is loud and clear? All of you. <clears throat> A patient met, continuing our discussion on Ames May 2017 question paper. Paralysis of both the upper and lower limb. Patient has not passed the urine. And tenderness is elicited in the cervical area. What is the best advice as a emergency clinician that you need to basically follow. The patient should not be shifted because he has a cervical pain. X-ray machine which is portable should be used after stabilization of the neck which is very very important thing that you need to carry on. A patient of motor accident admitted he does not speak but moans eyes are closed but opens to pain the right limb is not moving but the left limb is showing the movement to pain both the legs are in extended posture so <clears throat> is the voice okay are you sure yeah good good just when that you need to increase the volume of your speakers yeah. So, Glasgow Coma Scale, Ames November 2017, Ames May 2017. Once more, the same thing is going to come this year also because one of the nation's largest trauma center is in All India Institute. So, there's a reason you must be 100% sure. <clears throat> so, doctor. Eye opening, verbal response, motor response, the GCS scoring system, you should be 100% sure. A young boy presented with the history of fever, pain, abdomen and vomiting. He was febrile. The resident was eliciting the following sign where he is trying to press on the right iliac fossa in the McBurney point. McBurney point. So what is this uh, clinical condition? I mean, clinical sign basically called as. This is called the Mac Bernie's point tenderness. Here's what you need to know. As all of you know. But what is rousing sign? If you happen to palpate the left lower quadrant, left lower quadrant, that will push the gas towards the right side and makes the inflamed appendix to lead to tenderness in right iliac fossa. So pressing in left iliac fossa leading to pain in the right iliac fossa becomes the rousing sign is what you have to be very sure about. So what is care sign? The clot which is collected under the left hemidiaphragm whenever there is any splenic injury will lead to a referred pain to the left shoulder because of the phrenic nerves uh, C3, C4 innervation is called the care sign. Then this great man Charles Alfred Balance has come up with a balance sign. What is that? Whenever there is any splenic injury, spleen is on the left side. That splenic injury lead to a clot in the left side. So that is the reason there is a persistent dullness to percussion. Whenever you happen to percuss on the left side. Whereas on the right side. Typically, there is a shifting dullness because of the fluid blood, which is not yet clotted. 
So this is what you typically see whenever there is a splenic injury in the left um, um, left left side obviously is called the balance sign is what you need to basically remember. A patient underwent cholecystectomy and he was discharged on the same day. Post operatively on the day 3 he presented to the hospital with fever. A ultrasound showed that there was a right sided subdiaphragmatic fluid collection. So how do you want to basically manage such a fluid collection post laparoscopically after you have done the cholecystectomy is one of the favorite questions of the examiner. Some of you are going to be the top surgical gastroenterologist by 2023 or 24, right? So um, you should be doubly sure. How do you manage? So you have to put a pigtail catheter and uh, initiate a drainage of all those post-operative drainages after the laparoscopic cholecystectomy is what you have to basically remember. That's right. Crasal slimes. What are they? Crasal slimes are those greatest tension lines in the skin. So Langer slimes, all of you know, they are mapped out of a pattern of parallel lines on cadaver. They indicate the direction of the elastic tension of the skin in particular areas. Then Crasal slimes are the lines of the greatest tension and they coincide with the wrinkles, wrinkle lines and uh, they are the most appropriate lines for the surgical incision is what you have to remember. But this is that BMW question. Bakwas, mad, waste question, BMW. Don't worry, such kind of questions if you are unable to answer or while answering MCQ reviews you come across. You give, um, you take it damn easy, forget about it. But standard questions, you should do good. A middle-aged female presented with a recurrent bloody diarrhea. Colonoscopy shows multiple geographic ulcers. Histopathology has been shown. What is the likely diagnosis? So once more, inflammatory bowel disease, differences between the Crohn's and the ulcerative colitis. Invariably, one question is going to come in the tomorrow's exam, right? So, uh, Kriya, Kriya Tandava proposes Crohn's disease and uh, Sujata Chaudhary also proposes Crohn's for this. Absolutely right. So, Doc, terminal ileum is involved in Crohn's. Rectum in ulcerative colitis, colo, colorectal we call them, only rectum. The pattern of progression is by skipping in case of the Crohn's. It skips and reaches the mouth. Ulcerative colitis cannot skip, hence remains in colon. So it is proximally contiguous, ulcerative. Transmural involvement is in Crohn's. Crampy abdominal pain is a presenting feature of the Crohn's, whereas a bloody diarrhea is a feature in ulcerative colitis. Fistula, sepsis, obstruction is a feature of the Crohn's, whereas hemorrhagic toxic megacolon is a feature of ulcerative colitis. String sign of contour on x-ray is Crohn, whereas a lead pipe like of colon with the loss of hostrations on the barium is the feature of the ulcerative colitis. The risk of colon cancer is a slight increase in Crohn's but markedly increased in ulcerative colitis is what you need to remember. And if you do surgery, ulcerative colitis it is curative. But where will you expect cure in Crohn's? Crohn's involves the entire gut, right? So there is a reason only for the complications of stricture you use the surgery in case of the Crohn's is what you have to emphatically remember for your tomorrow's exam. Now, what, where is the maximum risk of carcinoma pancreas out of all these pancreatic lesions is a very, very important question. It looks to be an easy question, but it is a tough question. Why? Because 
we don't uh, remember Pudziger leading to pancreatic cancer and that too very high incidence of pancreatic cancer so that is the whole challenge right doc so uh, see sweetie patel thinks female adenomatous polyposis uh, but karunya thinks absolutely right pudziger so doctor pudziger it is autosomal dominant stk 11 is the gene hematomas and adenomatous polyposis of the small intestine but there is a 38 to 66 percent risk of gastrointestinal cancer 30 to 54 percent risk of breast cancer uterine cancer and lung 15 percent risk is there 11 to 36 percent incidence of pancreatic cancer very high in pudziger is what you have to ultimately remember 55 year old dysphagia upper gi biopsy of the esophagus is shown esophagus biopsy means what is the only thing examiner can ever ask on this planet earth doctor you can be able to answer it right um, answer it in the exam hall <clears throat> that it is the Barrett's esophagus is what you need to remember so this is a healthy non Barrett esophagus but it is a Barrett's esophagus is what you can see endoscopically how it looks like a normal esophagus may a normal squamous epithelium typically looks like this but the metaplastic columnar tissue that you see in Barrett's um, esophagus typically looks like this is what I want to underscore to all of you so always doctor when you are preparing for PG entrance in the reading room Pick up the third year, fourth year guys who are exam going. Bahut tension mein baith ke padte hai. MBBS exams pass karna, that is another uh, art. There is art and science of doing that. Some people are very artistic. Have a group of five to six uh, third year, fourth year guys surrounding you. You keep teaching small, small things like this to them, explaining them. Excellent way to revise. And they will be very happy to assist you. And some topics, you can ask them, okay, you read and uh, tell me, conduct a quiz for me. You ask your uh, juniors. So that is how the government medical colleges and uh, many medical colleges and reading rooms, preparation basically goes where... There is a symbiosis between us and our juniors, sometimes us and our seniors who are uh, repeating the entrance exam so many times. But it is a team effort of a group. Always remember that. A person met with a road traffic accident. Confusion of the anterior chest wall. Normal heart sounds are heard, but the breath sounds are decreased on the left side. Trachea is deviated towards the right side. Then what is the most likely um, to do as a first line management? Breath sounds are absent on one side and trachea moved towards contralateral side itself talks about pneumothorax. So how do you treat pneumothorax? How do you treat pneumothorax? Sujata thinks needle thoracostomy. You want to do just a needle thoracostomy or something? Much more uh, dramatic to drain a big pneumothorax. Kushbu Arora says, chest tube insertion and drainage, absolutely right, is what you should be sure about. Uh, some of you answered needle, no, needle thoracostomy. When will you do that is, emphysematous patients sometimes will have their blood ruptured. There a bit of needle in the uh, inter, uh, second intercostal space is okay. But such a significant pneumothorax shifting the mediastinum. No more waiting and watching. Sister prepare the ICD. One shout of you 
tuck, 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 your sister will arrange everything and then put the patient on oxygen, do the intercostal drainage tube, wash your hands and then take out, uh, have a cup of tea. That is a most wonderful life. As a resident, you are going to spend the moment uh, you are joining by March, April in one or other residencies. A middle-aged patient, fever, diarrhea, one week acute onset, erect chest, uh, abdominal x-ray is being shown to you. What is the most likely diagnosis you are able to see the wall of the gut the, uh, of the colon? So what is the most likely possibility? And there is an enlargement of the diameter. Toxic megacolon is the one which you need to basically remember. Toxic megacolon, volvulus is a little uh, wide bowling, but a good guess, not bad. But how will you explain fever and diarrhea? Fever and diarrhea for one week is a thing to show that there is a, a inciting agent which is inflammatory leading to toxic megacolon. So this is how typically a, a toxic megacolon looks like. Then regular sign, what is that? Whenever the bubble wall can be visualized on both the sides because of intra or extra luminal air, that is how the regular sign will bring the visibility of the wall of the bubble is what you need to remember whenever there's a perforation and the seepage of the gas into the peritoneum is what you need to remember. Now, doctor. According to the WHO guidelines, now we come to what are the 30 questions on obstetrics and gynecology in AIMS May 2017. Can I answer 30 out of 30? That should be your uh, outlook. Which is true about the management of the second stage of the labor? You need to give a manual support to the perineum and maintain a continuous deflection of the fetal head at the time of delivery. You know the stages of the delivery, D fire, right? D F I E R. So uh, that is very important. Episiotomy is not performed as a routine, be very sure. And uh, the delivery should never be performed. A lot of times, a lot of people don't teach actually. Lithotomy position is never for uh, delivering a baby. If you make the lady lie down on a lithotomy position, you are compromising the utero-placental circulation because the gravid uterus will compress the vessels. So that is never the right position for delivering. But unfortunately, they make uh, the poor village woman to lie down in a lithotomy position and try to keep on patting her for the bringing out of the delivery in a small poor uh, uh, village hospitals, not at all right, not at all correct. You need to be doubly sure. So supporting to provide a good upright position and comfort is the WHO recommendation to enable the delivery to happen um, is what you have to be doubly sure about. And uh, this is very inappropriate to make the woman lie down flat on emergency trolley and then delivering is... Uh, criminal so at least certain basic things like laboring delivering a laboring uh, woman is uh, the minimum thing that we should pray God to give us the skill to deliver for a lot of good things as a medical practitioner you don't need a lot of knowledge of the book you need to have that love passion a bit of anatomy and uh, want to do something good painless to the patient that's the feeling you need to have so don't make a woman labor in a lithotomy position. It will compromise the utero-placental blood flow is what you have to uh, basically remember. Now, always continuously provide the information, support, encouragement to the woman and her companion. That's most important uh, part. Your part is as oxidation is what, midwifery is what, Anyway, woman has to pass through her own pains to deliver the baby. Your job is to be on the side of it, 
like a movie director she is the actual hero of the movie right so you need to encourage act to pushing and urge to bear down is what you need to remember and uh, every 5 minutes you should listen to the fetal heart sounds you need to check the maternal pulse and blood pressure when there is any pre existing hypertension and you need to observe the descent and rotation of the presenting part uh, which are all the part of your management and uh, give a support to the perineum at the time of delivery to avoid the tears and uh, use the episiotomy not as a routine only when there is a high probability for a tear to happen and uh, be ready to augment the contractions with the intravenous oxytocin infusion during the second stage is considered to be one of the important double h word recommendation which you have to be very sure about a lady delivered a normal vaginal delivery and was discharged on day 3 she comes back with fever tachycardia and seizures seizures very important clue fundus shows papilledema there are no focal neurological deficits what is meaning of focal neurological deficit like paralysis what is the most likely possibility for a seizures and fundus showing papilledema which is a sign of the rise intracranial tension but it is not at a cerebrovascular accident you don't have a babinski positivity or anything so what is this presentation in the post uh, in the puerperal period cortical vein thrombosis pregnancy is a prothrombotic state so one of the reasons that can predispose to cortical vein thrombus if you do a cerebral venography the contrast can be able to pass until here and beyond it it is unable to pass the reason is there is a thrombus thrombosis which is preventing the flow of the contrast so that is a cortical venous thrombosis is what you need to remember 2% of the pregnancy associated strokes are attributable to the cortical venous thrombosis and during pregnancy last trimester and for about 6 to 8 weeks after the birth that is the puerperal period that is the high risk time for the development of the thromboembolic events is what you need to remember so infection instrumentation dehydration cesarean hypertension they are all the important risk factors so there are two ways by which a cortical venous thrombosis presents one is due to increased icit you have papilledema and because of the focal brain infarction and hemorrhage and hypoxia you will have seizures as a presenting feature and sometimes focal neurological deficits is what you need to remember so the next question the who what are the most important parameter for the semen standards for the adequacy of the sperms for fertilization semen may which quality that you basically take into consideration is a very important question invariably doctor ours is the populous country at the same time paradoxically a good good uh, prevalence of infertility if you look at the top 20 most high yield topics in obstetrics infertility or is 6th or 7th without a question on infertility there is no um, uh, there is no paper so lot of times repeatedly in uh, neat pg aims dnb who semen quality is a high yield topic in the database of the examiner you should be like a hacker should know what examiner want from you what is there in his database if you can be able to prepare well for what examiner's database has database of questions has you are done you will read little get the good rank that is the dream of all of us we wanted to work less hard and we want to get the good seat that's the whole idea honestly also that is true if you become dermatologist why do you need semen count but for the personal reasons maybe right you don't need so but for entrance you have to read so 
इट इज द मॉर्फोलॉजी ऑफ द स्पर्म्स स्पर्म का फेस कैसा है कैसे हंसता है उनका हेयर स्टाइल कैसा है वो सब फीचर्स से सीमेन का क्वालिटी का डिसीजन होता है सो मॉर्फोलॉजी इज मोर इंपॉर्टेंट देन इवन मोटिलिटी रनिंग रेस कैसा करता है मिस्टर स्पर्म इज द नेक्स्ट फीचर बट उसके पहले उसका चेहरा कैसा है कैसा मुस्कुराता है दैट इज ऑल वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इज वॉट डब्ल्यू एच ओ से एंड प्रिपेड सैंपल्स आर एसेस्ड अंडर 100x ऑयल इमर्शन ऑब्जेक्टिव एंड मिनिमम 200 हंड्रेड स्पर्मेटो हुआ शुड बी काउंटेड अकॉर्डिंग टू द एग्जामिनर एंड द फील्ड फॉर काउंटिंग मस्ट बी रैंडम एंड टिपिकली 2010 is the most recent recommendation of WH4. So, what is the gold standard criteria before uh, the future is going to come? That uh, if you want to marry on the shadi.com, they will also ask you to put the WH4 semen report also. Be doubly sure that uh, you are up to the world standards, right? So, volume is more than 1.5 ml. Sperm count is more than 15 into 10 to the power of 6. Total sperm count more than 39 into 10 to the power of 6. Forget what is your NEET PG rank. At least as much big is your NEET PG rank, that much be the minimum total sperm count is what the WHO's expectation, right? So total motility more than 40 percent must be in the running race. Progressive motility must be more than 32 percent. Vitality must be more than 58, and morphology must be more than 4% must be in a good shape is uh, what you need to remember that is what is the semen count a neat pg toppers bade bade interviews de da na don't be always biased maybe if i am given a mic if i am a neat pg topper i will say oh i used to read at least for about uh, 15 to 16 hours every day If you sit in the reading room, 16-15 hours. If you happen to read, maybe you may become a topper. But in spite of the natural thermoprotective mechanism given in the scrotal sac by the Almighty, still that thermogenic failure will be there. You may get the seed, but your sperms become completely immortal. So if some topper says, "No, no, 15-16 hours I am reading means you can consider him." on par with the klein filters hyalinization of the seminiferous tubules so doctor that much of serious padhai kabhi nahi karna so that you don't generate too much heat in the reading room four five hours a day more than enough spend a couple of hours with your friends on the youtube channel with dr murli bharadwaj seat nahi mare to it is mera zimmedari hoga theek hai so that is very very important now in endometriotic lesions histology represents what obviously endometrial histology is like the stock market estrogen is like the government policy government policy mein jara idhar udhar ho gaya to immediately stock market will keep changing so also your sensitivity of the histological changes is what you need to basically remember <coughs> so If you look at the various endometriotic lesions, you have superficial lesions, which are the early red lesions, powder burn, gunshot, white plaques, deeply infiltrating endometriosis, more than 5 mm depth. Similarly, on the ovary also, you have the lesions, chocolate cyst of the ovary, etc. You should be very sure about. Your Rh negative mother. indirect combs test positive she was negative um index indirect combs test was negative and she was given a anti d during 28 weeks of pregnancy so what is the international protocol for the rh iso immunization i mean rh um uh, rh iv immunoglobulin i mean rh immunoglobulin administration how many doses what duration is a frequently asked question so at 28 weeks of gestation 
unless the father of the baby is known to be RHD negative. If both RHD negative woman marries RHD negative guy in the shadi.com or meeting on a discussion forum in UMedico app, it's okay. You don't need to give the RHD. Why? If the father is RHD positive, I mean RH positive, mother is RH negative, at 28 weeks of gestation, you have to give. And within 72 hours after the delivery of a RHD positive infant, then you need to also give one more dose is what you need to remember. Any abortion also, first trimester pregnancy loss also, you have to give the RH uh, um, immunoglobulin. And any invasive procedure like chorionic villus sampling, amniocentesis, fetal blood sample collection, any of these procedures also, we need to give the RH immunoglobulin is what need to be remembered. Now a 32 year old female came for a routine pap smear testing. The report came as carcinoma in situ. What is the best next step that you want to do? Once more doctor. Pap smear, pap smear, uh, it's a very good question. Sweetie Patil is asking, what is the, what if the father is negative? Came back. Yeah. <clears throat> Is it fine? No, the broadcast. Just check the voice clear. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, very good question. Uh, we have discussed uh, entire story of RH isoimmunization on the UMedico. I leave uh, the video to be reviewed. Uh, very good uh, question. If the mother is positive, RH positive, but father is RH negative and the baby happened to be RH negative, what do you want to do is a good question. Yeah. Now, uh, what are the various options available? What is the terminology? Of the pap smear is my uh, I want to quick uh, review to with you. A typical squamous cells of uncertain significance is called ASC US, ASC US. And uh, from the biopsy terminology, it is called atypia or metaplasia. Generally, it is inconclusive. You need a follow up. ASC H, ASC H means what? A typical squamous cells, but cannot rule out the high grade. Then refer for colposcopy. There is a 1% malignancy chances. If it is a low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, LSG, LGS, IL, what do you want to do? You refer for colposcopy, 1% malignant chances. But if it is a high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion that is equivalent in the histological terms to CIN2 and CIN3, if you do happen to do biopsy, that is uh, very important. Here also you refer for colposcopy. Very happy to see 183 online viewers. In spite of Naraka Chaturdasi, right? So Today, treat Naraka sir as the ignorance of need PG for you. Kill him and nicely enjoy the light festival tomorrow and uh, have a dream in your heart. That is very important. That hum karke dikhayenge, ban, bana kar deke dikhayenge ki we are the need PG toppers. That is a dream you should have when that lantern is giving that beautiful light, right? And uh, re-emerge yourself another 50 days from the Diwali to the NEET PG where you actually crack the examiner's paper. In that 50 days, you should be sure 
to totally transform yourself into an aggression by mastering the 650 high yield topics that is very very important right so low high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion is equivalent to the cin2 and 3 whereas low grade is equivalent to cin1 the main difference is the chance of a low grade becoming malignancy is 1% whereas high grade becoming is 1 to 5% that is a fundamental difference then atypical glandular cells basically you have a cervix and uh, uh, you have got uh, the area which is uh, uh, the uterus so you have a squamocolumnar junction so if you happen to get glandular cells which are atypical then uh, you need to suspect possibility of uh, endometrium of the uterus being uh, malignant so that is that is the reason once more you have to do colposcopy endometrial biopsy if you happen to get atypical glandular cells then the chances are 30 percent of malignancy is what you have to fundamentally remember a midwife at a phc did pervaginal examination of a woman in labor who is having eight centimeters of cervical dilatation 70 percent of cervical effacement and the fetal head is at plus one station so what does this plus one mean to say every department has their own terminology you go to neurologist how are the deep tendon reflexes they say i think somewhere between plus two to plus three so what is this plus one in case of obstetrics so doctor it is the ischial spine which is considered to be the benchmark which is called the area of ischial spines malumena bony ischial spines they are the ones which are the benchmark usse andar ja rahe to it is minus one centimeter two centimeter three centimeter four and five inside then that is called minus if it is after the ischial spines outside of the pelvic outlet then from there one centimeter two centimeter three centimeter is all plus one two three four five that is how the uh, complete uh, from the ischial tuberosity to the ischial spine around five centimeters of distance will be there and uh, ia ia bolna padta fetal head ko when it is coming out of the ischial spines interischial diameter is considered to be the zero station is what you need to remember so this is how you have a undilated um, cervical loss and uh, two centimeter thickness is what you are able to find that of the isthmus and uh, this is half centimeter dilatation and half centimeter thickness and this is how a complete effacement looks like and this is a two centimeter dilatation and this is a completely effaced and a completely dilated to 10 centimeters so that is how it looks like that is how the progression of the labor a 61 year old postmenopausal woman with a family history of ovarian cancer and pain abdomen abdominal pain ultrasound shows a smooth cyst in the right ovary what is the next thing that you want to do in this 61 year old postmenopausal woman on hormonal replacement therapy presenting with a ovarian cyst which is smooth is the question to all of you so you should think of the possibility of a ovarian cancer so you need to check ca 125 and advise a regular follow-up is considered to be the important management of choice 80 percent of serous tumors ca 125 is elevated but 50% of the serous early stage tumors, mucinous tumors and clear cell carcinomas, it is not elevated. So it is not a reliable diagnostic marker. But if you operate, post-operatively if you want to follow, to monitor the chemotherapy response, CA-125 is a very good investigation is what you need to basically remember. And if you give chemotherapy, 
within three cycles if the ca125 normalizes it is considered to be a wonderful therapeutic response to the chemotherapy is what you have to ultimately remember then in the case of the postmenopausal women if the ca125 is elevated and a simple cyst is exceeding 5 to 10 centimeters if there is an abnormal color of doppler flow pattern of the circulation to the cyst they are the indications to consider it as a very ominous kind of a ovarian cyst likely to be malignant and that need to be subjected to surgery is what i want to underscore to all of you in which kind of surgery maximum risk of the ureter injury is a very important question i still remember asking my when i was a house surgeon asking the postgraduate <coughs> what is the difference between dgo and md gynecology both of you are the same women same pelvis same fetus what is the difference between dgo and uh, md gynops my resident laughed and said it's all about uh, what is the probability of you are causing a ureteric injury when you conduct a hysterectomy two years is a less experience less injuries you cost three years is more experience more injuries you cost so the whole purpose of three years is to do a hysterectomy without causing ureteric injury you are super duper md gynops right doc so if you do laparoscopic abdominal hysterectomy the chance of causing the um, um, ureteric injury is much much higher is what you need to basically remember so 0.4 percent is the accepted in incidence of ureteric injuries doctor all types of hysterectomy 0.3 to 6 percent vaginal hysterectomy is 0.2 per thousand supra cervical abdominal hysterectomy 0.5 per thousand total abdominal hysterectomy 0.9 per thousand whereas laparoscopic is 7 per thousand is a very high incidence of ureteric injury much higher with a laparoscopic hysterectomy which is through the keyhole is what you need to appreciate five most commons you should know in this particular area of ureteric injury what are the most common site for the ureter to undergo injury it is the pelvic brim near the infundi below pelvic ligament is the most common site what is the most common type of injury obstruction most common activity leading to the ureteric injury you are trying to achieve a hemostosis apply a clamp unfortunately thinking it is vessel but it turns out to be ureter that is the most common underlying cause leading to the development of the injury and uh, most common time when you diagnose this is 50 percent of times intraoperatively you know that you have uh, killed a ureter 50 percent of times unfortunately post operatively you will be able to know so that is all the um, story that's right then uh, 24 year old female amenorrhea for three months but lh and fsh are elevated fsh and lh are elevated three times the normal what is the most likely cause she has amenorrhea amenorrhea can be because of what anovulation anovulation is because of a low lh and uh, sorry is because of um uh, uh typically her lh and fsh are elevated three times the normal right so um what is the most likely cause for uh, amenorrhea amenorrhea is because of the estrogen progesterone production may garbad ho gaye the so estrogen progesterone ki production may garbad kyo hota hai if the ovary is unable to produce like dysgenesis or the LHFSH which are supposed to come from pituitary are not produced 
how do you know whether the cause is central or whether the cause is, is within the gonad LHFSH if it is very high that means it is a hypogonadotropic sorry hypergonadotropic hypogonadism that means the problem is there at the level of the ovary so that is the reason you need to quickly check for the estradiol levels next in order to make out your diagnosis is a very very important question chandana asking is 2018 may completed no this is 2017 may we finished 2017 november after that we will take out may 2017 but don't expect me to give you before november 18th the november uh, aims mere haath mein nahi hai magar ye sab questions ko milaye to november 2018 usi se nikalta bahar so november 18th after exam is over you send me the questions on recall 19th november aapke farmaish program mein we will do the revision of uh, all the aims questions 200 questions review karenge right so what is true about variable decelerations now comes the mother of all topics fetal heart monitoring is a very very important question <clears throat> how is the cracker sound right so a unforgettable evening after 10 years also the cracker sound in the video will always remain the students will uh, my commitment to you is even on diwali i will take a evening class right i am standing by my commitment tomorrow we will take a holiday definitely so uh, is a cracker sound interrupting just check it eh? yeah so doctor any drop in the fetal heart rate to less than 70 bpm beats per minute for about 60 seconds is considered to be the significant variable deceleration is what i want to underscore to all of you now what is the meaning of early deceleration late deceleration variable deceleration variable decelerations first of all why do they come is a very important question <clears throat> uh variable deceleration is due to cord compression early deceleration is due to head compression late deceleration is due to fetal hypoxia these are the three favorite questions last 20 years may thousand times they might have asked the same question repeatedly right doctor so be doubly sure about yeah Raju says, "Will there be a, a session the day before? It will be the day, day before and the day after also, except on the day of exam. Yeah, I want to give you a little break to enjoy that day evening with a good champagne, having had cracked the exam. So, talk variable deceleration. What is the meaning of that? Whenever you call variable early, late deceleration of the whose deceleration fetal heart rate." is in comparison to what it is in comparison to the contraction of the uterus you'll be comparing it with the contraction of the uterus so every time uterus is contracting you get a rise of the pressure so these are all the uterine contractions yeah now uh if you look at the heart rate there is a fall of the heart rate here and once more it recovered compare look at it versus um the rise of the uterine contraction uh, force they both are not in sync with each other after after the uterine contraction there is a uh, deceleration here another location after the almost uh, along with the contraction there is a deceleration so sometimes it is occurring before contraction sometimes after contraction so there is no comparison between the deceleration pattern and the uterine contraction pattern that means to say this deceleration is because of the cord compression is what you have to basically remember 
Now, how do you define it? A abrupt onset of the nadir less than 30 seconds with a drop of at least 15 beats per minute below the baseline for more than 15 seconds but less than 2 minutes is the definition of the variable deceleration is what you have to basically remember. So whenever variable decelerations are there but once more one more thing is also there if you look at the fetal heart rate baseline there is some amount of variability keep happening so that variability that happens in the heart rate in a small undulant manner instead of sudden decelerations is con that normal little variability is also required so if the fetal heart rate variability is normal even though variable decelerations are there they don't represent any hypoxia but if the fetal heart rate variability is diminished or absent along with the variable deceleration then that is suggestive of a pathological VC variable deceleration is what you have to basically remember. Now when do you call variable deceleration uh, Chandana says uh, uh, I think motility is more important than morphology. I consider morphology is the correct recommendation given by WHO. Still if you have any uh, discrepancy please uh, reconfirm never believe a teacher. Um, you can also reconfirm as far I remember it as morphology from what I confirm. Uh, but that's a good point. So variable decelerations are called severe if they last more than one minute, 60 seconds. And if they fall below 70 beats per minute or if they have a drop of around 60 beats per minute below the baseline rate. This is how you define a significant severe variable deceleration is what you need to basically remember. So these are the variable decelerations doctor as what you can see. Lasting more than 60 seconds and falling more than 60 beats per minute below the baseline is considered to be the most important uh, criteria for the variable deceleration um, is what you need to remember. That's good. So what is the baseline rate is a very important question. Fetal heart rate 110 to 160. How much of variability is normal variability around 5 beats. Normally there will be no decelerations. Some accelerations are present. What is called non reassuring if the basal fetal heart rate itself is 100 to 109 that is called fetal bradycardia if it is 161 to 180 that is called fetal tachycardia and if the variability is below 5 for about 40 to 90 minutes that is abnormal and uh, any early deceleration or a typical variable deceleration Early deceleration means head compression, variable deceleration means cord compression. That is not reassuring. Then when it is called as absolutely abnormal, non-reassuring is different from certified abnormal. When do you call abnormal? If it is under 100 or over 180 and uh, that is a baseline heart rate. And if the variability is under 5 for almost uh, 90 minutes, one and a half hour. Then if the deceleration is a late deceleration, absolutely it is uh, abnormal, certified. And any atypical variable is called a abnormal, uh, I mean atypical variable deceleration is considered to be absolutely abnormal. That is how you basically define the fetal 
heart rate pattern. So, is there any number that is important? Definitely. Two non-reassuring or one certified abnormal feature is pathological. And you need to do a fetal scalp sampling or deliver the baby urgently. You should put up a parachute on and the baby should eject out. That is considered to be the goal. So, fetal tocography um, uh, is uh, one of the important uh, aspects of uh, the obstetrical clinical practice you should be doubly sure about. So, define bradycardia doctor, fetal bradycardia. This is going to be a single liner, neat PG bullet question, less than 110. Tachycardia more than 160, normal 110 to 160 and minimum baseline duration should be at least 2 minutes and if minimum baseline duration is less than 2 minutes then baseline is called indeterminate is what need to be remembered. So this is how the baseline fetal heart rate without any decelerations typically look like. This is an example of how a tachogram of fetal bradycardia less than 100 is uh, the one that you see. Of course, less than 110 you call suspicious, less than 100 is abnormal. This is the fetal tachycardia where the baseline heart rate is above 150 beats per minute, typically looks like. Uh, Shoye Bhagat confirms it is morphology more than motility. Very good. Shoye Jindabad. Now, uh, this is another example of a fetal tachycardia, 170 to 180 beats per minute and a mild amount of variable decelerations are also present. Now doctor, um, I, uh, this is another example of a early deceleration. See, fetal contraction, I mean uterine contraction is happening here. But uh, if you look at uh, the early deceleration, the deceleration started during the early part of the uterine contraction, hence called as early deceleration. Okay, and uh, the nadir is happening at the peak of the uterine contraction. That's how a early deceleration looks like. Tomorrow, examiner will simply give this kind of a tocogram and ask you: Is it because of uh, head compression, cord compression, fetal hypoxia? How do you want to interpret? Simply if you compare the uterine contraction nadir versus, I mean uh, the peak and the decelerations nadir and see whether it is early, variable or um, late deceleration and then you need to come to um, uh, is uh, very important. Yeah. Now, uh, I leave the literature for you. Now. First trimester of pregnancy. Dr. Sony wrongly advises believe in your teacher is key to success. No. Doubt your teacher. Recheck it. That is the key to success. Tomorrow, don't agree if your chief says the diagnosis TB. Still you think, is it, are there any uh, evidences that can be marshaled to consider this to be not the TV. The moment you start doing that, that is where all the learning begins. Let me tell you. But I am also like a student before coming to class, do three to four times double check and then deliver the class. But there will be errors of commission and omission. So please uh, uh, recheck all of them. Huh? Now, first trimester of pregnancy, anencephaly is something that you can very much diagnose. This is a super duper question, which you have to be very sure about. A middle-aged woman comes to the OPD with twin pregnancy. She already had two first trimester abortions. She has a three-year-old female child who was born at the end of the ninth month of gestation, that is a full term. Then what is the exact GP representation of her? 
is a very 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 important question it looks easy but you should be very clear on the concept of what is g what is p what is t what is a what is l everything now let's talk about it g is gravida kitne bar pregnancy aaya confirmed pregnancy that become gravida usme kitne births birth of a child hua after 20 weeks of gestation that becomes the para so you have five digit system called gt pol g is number of pregnancies t is full term pregnancies between 37 to 40 weeks p is pre term deliveries which are 20 to 36 weeks a is abortions and miscarriages which are before 20 weeks l is the number of living children abhi batao yaar total number of pregnancies kitna hua isko she already has two um first trimester abortions right presently she is pregnant so 2 plus 1 3 and she has a 3 year old female child who was born at the end so one more pregnancy four times who pregnant hua usme ek living child hai do abortions hai abhi fir wo pregnant hai right so four bar pregnant hua isliye g4 ho gaya then uh, p is para so what is meant by para number of births that have happened after 20 weeks kitna hua she had one child um uh the abortions that she had are all first trimester so you don't count it only that particular baby who is born is to be counted in para so she is g4 p1 then what is pal how many preterm deliveries so she didn't have any preterm delivery that one delivery that she had is a term delivery so there is a reason zero then number of abortions and miscarriages she had are two isliye zero plus two then the number of living children she has is one so zero plus two plus one is the typical um, gp gt paul gt paul denomination once more the examiner is going to ask you in the forthcoming neat pg you should answer this what is the next step in the management of a 32 years old woman five year history of primary infertility what is primary infertility what is secondary infertility kabhi bhi pregnancy nahi hue to that become i mean kabhi bhi pregnancy conception could not happen primary secondary is earlier conceived a baby grown and then uh, after that once more you are trying for a baby infertility secondary five year old history of primary infertility but bilateral tubal block seen at the cornu what do you want to do for her laparoscopy hysteroscopy is considered to be the important way you handle whenever there is a bilateral tubal block is what you need to remember so if the if there is a hydrosalping then clipping and uh, in vitro fertilization and uh, or uh, intra cytoplasmic sperm injection is considered to be the choice if it is a mid tubal or a fimbrial block then ivf plus uh, ivf without uh, icsi is considered to be management then if there is a corneal tubal block then hysteroscopic corneal catheterization is the most rewarding procedure for you to manage a tubal block which is corneal so laparoscopy plus hysteroscopy is the one which is the management of choice for this bilateral tubal block happening at the cornu is what you need to basically remember so it's very simple um you should imagine a fallopian tube a fimbrial end the corneal end and the uterus and what are you doing if you imagine uh you can easily answer it 
A pregnant woman at 36 weeks of gestation, during the morning round, she is lying supine. And this is the syndrome that is uh, expected to happen. What is this syndrome called? When the gravid uterus compresses the inferior vena cava, if the woman is lying down supine, then that leads to development of a decreased circulation and leads to hypotension is what you need to remember. Now, a midwife at PHC is monitoring pregnancy and maintaining a partograph at how much cervical dilatation should the partograph plotting should be started. It is during the active phase of the first stage. First stage is divided into latent phase from 0 to 3 centimeters dilatation and from 4 to 10 centimeters is called active phase during which you will be uh, doing the partogram labeling. Once more you should remember, we um, PGA Chandigar ka paper recently discussed ki hai aur AIMS ka bhi discussed November 2017 ka. Friedman's partograph is a favorite area for examiner. Chodega nahi examiner aapko. 30 out of 30 mark ke aana gynops mein if you are Dr. Murli Bharadwa students. So from the active phase 4 cm to 10 cm is the time where the partograph um, should be done is what need to be remembered. Now what is the sequelae of a fetal alcohol syndrome is my question to all of you. You find a microcephaly, holoprosencephaly, thinning of the corpus callosum, but not macro. So a small palpable fissure, a smooth philtrum, a thin upper lip, microscope cephaly, low nasal bridge, epicanthal folds, minor ear anomalies and micrognathia. They are the ones unforgettable about the fetal alcohol syndrome is what you need to remember. Congenital CMV infection. Once more, in the AIMS November question paper, periventricular calcifications were given last time. If you remember, we discussed uh, November 2017. Torch group of infections, examiner ke, database mein, bite ke, hai, among the 650 high yield topics. From that 650 high yield topics database, questions keep pumping into your actual exam paper. If you know, what is the examiner's expectation of that 650 topics and prepare for them perfectly? You will crack the neat PG or any JIPMAR uh, or any entrance exam fundamentally. So torch is such a favorite and frequently asked question. So CMB is the most common cause of non-syndromic sensorineural hearing loss is what you need to remember. So for those students who have come first time for the today's evening class, every day evening 6 to 8, I mean 5 to 8 p.m., you have a session with either Dr. Murli or one of the other teachers. Free, let me tell you. But after the session is over, you want to review, you should identify where you are going wrong. Already we have a video library available in the UMedico uh, app and anatomy to medicine.com by a subscription which is available just for this next two months at uh, 5000 bucks. You can WhatsApp the above helpline number. They will help you to buy the subscription with which you get mock test entire video library of the DNB, JIPMER and all the question bank reviews. So we will be very happy to see you. Um, on the U Medico app, participating in quizzes, etc. So, five year old child, loose stools, no history of fever or blood in the stools, irritable, drinks water hastily. Once more, a repeated pattern. November 2017, also you have a ORS, dehydration, how much, what is the uh, fluid you need to administer was the question. So, how do you want to manage? What is the degree of severity of uh, the dehydration in this given case is the examiner's question. So give zinc supplementation, ORS and ask the mother to come back if some danger signs develop because this is not a severe dehydration. So zinc supplementation plus ORS stops the diarrhea faster. 
and uh, adding zinc has a great uh, protective action in managing a case of diarrhea. So what is a ORS and Rizomal? What is the composition? Like a parrot, you must uh, remember it and rattle out in the tomorrow's exam. Glucose, 111. Rizomol, it is 125. And zinc is 0.3 in Rizomol. You also have copper. Osmolality is 300 in case of Rizomol. And uh, the conventional, it is 310. So the differences in the composition of the various constituents invariably one question is asked in the exam. So how do you grade dehydration? Well alert, restless, irritable or lethargic. Skin pinch goes back quickly, slowly or goes back very slowly. Eyes are sunken in both some dehydration and severity. Both don't know me. Eyes are sunken. You call some dehydration where fluid deficit is 5 to 10 percent body weight or 50 to 100 ml per kg of body weight. You call it a severe when it is more than 10 percent of the body weight or more than 100 ml per kg of the body weight. You call it as a severe dehydration is what you have to be doubly sure. Now if it is a mild dehydration, what do you want to do? Give as much as the fluid child want. Children less than 2 years of age, 50 to 100 ml. 2 to 10, 100 to 20 ml is uh, considered to be the fluid replenishment. Then if it is a moderate dehydration in the first four, four hours, how much ORS need to be given depends upon the age and weight of the child. Less than 4 months, less than 5 kgs, 200 to 400 ml. 4 to 11 months, 5 to 7.9 kgs, 400 to 600 ml. I'm not going to read the whole uh, values for you. But this was the table on which November 2017 may question Once more, May 2017 may So, dehydration management. Pneumonia, degrees of severity. What is the management in children? Top questions of the examiner's database. Exam database. Hacked. So, you should be doubly sure to revise them. Is my point to all of you. If it is a very severe dehydration, then if it is an infant in the first one hour, give 30 ml per kg of IV fluid, preferably ringer lactate or normal saline. Then next 5 hours, give 70 ml per kg. Older children, within half an hour, you should give 30 ml per kg. Next to two and a half hours, you should give 70 ml per kg is considered to be the recommendation. You need to be uh, very good question. Sweetie Patil says, sir, how to remember is the question, right? Just give me one more week time. I am giving a new feature in you Medico app where all the notes will come point wise like your inbox in the Gmail in the mobile phone. You can always bookmark and set up a recommendation, uh, notification uh, of reminder. It keeps reminding you all those points in the notes that you are bound to forget. So until you tell the you medico, hey you medico, enough, I already remember it. You once more unnotify um, the particular point. So that is a new uh, API that they are coming up in the U Medico app that is going to help all of you. Actually also preparation to entrance is a dirty game of remembering at least three to four thousand things. That three four thousand points which are unless you multiple times revise it you can't remember. So uh, we are going to help you out in the U Medico app so don't worry. Six year old child fever, pancytopenia, very important. Generalized weakness, weight loss, generalized lymphadenopathy, peripheral smear is showing lymphoblastic cells. Child ka leukemia kya hota hai? ALL. Elderly geriatric population mein leukemia kya hota hai? CLL. Middle-aged guys mein 
any age, generally 30 to 40, AML or CML. That's how you remember. So it is a classical case of ALL. Pediatric bolte hi wo ALL hai. But pancytopenia hai bolke, don't get confused that it is aplastic anemia because this uh, classical lymphoblastic cells in the peripheral smear are a very important clue for you to make the diagnosis is what need to be remembered. So, in spite of Naraka Chaturdasi, Diwali, 172 of you are online. I am very, very happy across India. So, call more and more of your friends. Please post this link, youtube.com slash online MBBS as a free class every day evening. In all your Facebook groups, social media groups, Twitter groups. So, that, that brings more and more number of preparing aspirants become aware and come. And uh, ideally, learning should be free, should be affordable. The purpose of any coaching should be to stimulate you to read. And uh, you should find that energy ignited in you. Unless that is ignited in you, you cannot be able to win the Olympics of need PT. Be very sure. Why in the Olympics they run with a lantern? The whole purpose of coaching is to add that lantern to you, doctor. Be very sure. 18 months, um, so yeah, 18 months child weighing 11.5 kgs, fever, respiratory difficulty, lethargic, respiratory rate 46 breaths per minute, but no chest retraction. What is the appropriate management? Once more, severity of pneumonia, severity of dehydration, be very, very sure about. Dr. Sony says, Tomorrow will the class will be there or not? Good question. Actually, today is my son's, uh, my younger son, Abhinav Bharadwaj's birthday. He said, Dad, uh, uh, are you there? I'll be waiting to cut the cake. I said, uh, you are my biological child. But there are a lot of my academic children across the country. I will make them all to cut the cake in the academic feast and come back but please wait for me uh, after I come we will cut the cake so uh, today is okay we have a class tomorrow I want all of you to enjoy the light festival day after tomorrow we will have the class so you prescribe the oral antibiotics warn the danger signs and send him home that is most important so how do you Classify the pneumonia is a very, very important question, doctor. There is cough, no tachypnea, no pneumonia. Cough, tachypnea, but no sternal or rib retraction. He is able to drink water. No cyanosis, you call pneumonia. But cough, tachypnea with the rib retraction, intercostal retraction, then you call severe and the moment there is a central cyanosis, you call it as very severe pneumonia is what you need to basically remember. Thank you. I will tell all of you that you wished and blessed the little boy. I'm blessed with two kids. Elder one is 22 and the younger one is 10 with the same wife, of course, 12 years gap. So uh, that's the reason I tell you whatever be the need PG result. Don't stop certain biological minimum pleasures of the life, like marrying someone or falling in love with someone. Entrance is different and having a life is different. Automatically entrance may everyone will get, win, but that should not affect you at a very personal level. You should be equally accomplished at the personal level. That's my gospel to all of you on this wonderful evening. <clears throat> So, a patient presented with fever, cough and expectoration. There is a raised total leukocyte count. Chest x-ray is being shown. What do you see? A cavity. Pneumatoceal is what you are able to see. And uh, what is the likely organism leading to the pneumatoceal is a very, very important question. <clears throat> so, it is the Staphylococcus aureus, which is considered to be the most likely cause leading to pneumatoceles. Once more, 
one question on the clips scissors needles suture material without that there is no paper so doctor orthopedic surgeon is asking you to give a bone holding forceps what else he will ask orthopedic means which is a bone holding forceps out of all this right if he is asking bone holding forceps if the nurse happened to give a toothbrush he will get a heart attack right some surgeons are very ferociously angry guys anger management syndrome uh, some guys will be missing some will be very cool even patient is going to hypotension bleeding excessively very smilingly they manage everything all the this thing that is a cool temper all needed in a surgeon so doctor this is a this is how typically a bone holding forceps typically look like is what i want to uh, basically remember <clears throat> so let us quickly run this is called a divers retractor especially for deep abdominal or chest incisions to retract A lot of times surgeons keep asking diver 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 this is the richardson's retractor to retract the deep abdominal or chest incisions once more then you have a gaulet to retract shallow or a superficial incisions and this is a malleable or a ribbon retractor for the deep wounds it is of different shapes then this is a straight mayo used to cut the suture in supplies also called suture scissors this is a curved mayo used to cut a heavy tissue like fascia muscle uterus breast and this is the medzen bone scissors favorite uh, question of the examiner used to cut the delicate tissue definitely this is going to come in the neat pg one day this is alice A lot of times surgeons keep saying give me alice give me alice it is to grasp the tissue it is available in both short and long sizes then this is babcock very commonly used if you even do 10 days of surgery posting seriously and went to ot you will be knowing babcock used to grasp the delicate tissue like intestine fallopian tube or ovary this is the cocher which is used to grasp the heavy tissue um and can it can also be used as a clamp then you have a mayo hegar's needle holders used to hold the needles when suturing so that is all the instrumentology required for the neat pg exam now doctor <clears throat> which part of the second metatarsal is fractured in case of the march fracture so it is the neck so this is a normal metatarsal second metatarsal people who do a long walking 50 km 60 km like cavalry men they develop the march fracture like this one this one more example of the second metatarsal uh, neck which is getting fractured uh, now in the fracture which you are seeing here at the level of the elbow what is the vascular structure that is most likely to get injured it is a brachial artery which can injure in this anatomical location is what you need to remember now um raju malala says latest is shaft more than neck oh my god what a miserable uh, um, life the more and more you are delayed in cracking the seat from the neck to shaft to somewhere else it will go so better quickly get the seat faster haglund's deformity where do you see that typically in the ankle at the point of the insertion of the achilles into the calcaneum that is the area where there is a spur like growth which is very, very painful that is basically called the haglund's deformity this is the bursa in this area this is the bony spur which is called as 
the Haglund's deformity is what you need to remember. Once more, this another clinical example of how, how the HLE tendon become irritated because of this bony enlargement when it is rubbing the shoe which you are wearing. Haglund's deformity need to be remembered. Galeazzi fracture dislocation. What is true about it? In this, the radial shaft undergoes fracture and interosseous membrane undergoes a tear along with a triangular fibrocartilage complex which is called Galeazzi fracture dislocation. So you can see how a Galeazzi typically looks like where the radial shaft undergoes the fracture. At the lower end, that's the, that's the most important. Among the radio and ulna, radials lower end is the one where you find the Galeazzi fracture. So a lot of times students have a confusion on Galeazzi versus Montegia, which is upper, which is lower. I still remember one of our student uh, telling, Sir, jo galiz hota hai, wo niche rehta hai. So, galiazi hota hai niche. Mount Everest jo hota hai, upar rehta hai. Is liye Montegia hota hai, upar wala fracture. So, that is how, um, from then onwards, what my student told. He is now a top surgeon, right? Uh, in Vijayawada. So, um, I always remember whenever this fracture dislocation comes, the mnemonic of him. So upper and lower end is easy, but which is radius, which is ulnar fracture is important. You have a Montegia fracture. Yam ko jab aap likre hai, usme U fit hota na? U. So ulna upper end is the one which is involved. Then Galeazzi ka G aisa likhe to R dikta hai. So radius is the one. Gullies jo hota hai, niche reta hai, is liye lower end. Mountain jo hota hai, upper hota hai, upper end. So upper end, ulnar fracture is Montegia. Lower end, radial fracture is Galeazze, is what you need to basically remember. You will also have different ways of remembering some of the good mnemonics. Please keep posting some ways of remembering common things in the U Medico discussion forum that you have in the dashboard. Uh, so that other students uh, will uh, look at it, laugh at it, like it and they will also add their own uh, ways of remembering the things. That's how the preparation is supposed to be. And you get all notifications nowadays in the discussion forum on the UMedico app. So you can 24x7 be well connected. So uh, what is the mechanism for the galeazzi? A direct blow to the back of the wrist or a fall on the outstretched hand is a common reason for galeazzi and open reduction and internal fixation is considered to be the management of choice. Very good. Surya Prabha also gives a good one. Yam is medial, so Montage is medial, which is Alna. Very easy to remember. Excellent. So, 75 year old, fell in the bathroom, had a hip dislocation, which is being shown to you. First of all, you should know, recognize whether this can be called a posture dislocation or anterior dislocation. Then you should know how will be the attitude. So, typically, it is the, let us go, it is an anterior dislocation basically. But let us uh, quickly go various kinds of dislocation. This is an example of how a posterior dislocation looks like. And it results from a load which is applied to the femur uh, when the hip is flexed. Typically when you sit in the car, your hip is flexed. And whenever there's a dashboard injury, then you get a posture dislocation, right? So it is the dashboard injury, posture dislocation. In posture dislocation, what is the attitude? Flexion, internal rotation and adduction. This thigh want to be close to the other thigh. It want to look at the other thigh, internal rotation, and it want to be in a flexion. That is posture dislocation of the hip 
which is unforgettable. Very good. Fadir and Fabex is a very favorite uh, way of remembering. Yeah, whichever the way. Anterior dislocation. The hip is minimally flexed but externally rotated. Look at the foot. How do you know external or internal rotation in the attitude is? Look at the foot. Foot is externally rotated and it is markedly abducted. It wants to stay away from the normal, foot, normal leg. That is a anterior dislocation of the hip. So typically what is the mechanism for the anterior dislocation? Kyo hota hai? If there is any extreme abduction and external rotation of the hip, then the anterior hip capsule become torn and uh, the femoral head is levered out anteriorly is what need to be remembered. Now, whenever you have a traumatic shoulder dislocation, what is the most common, especially young people, most common uh, challenge, recurrent shoulder dislocation, it predisposes, especially in the young people is what need to be remembered. Almost 50 to 90 percent of the patients under the 20, there will be a recurrent dislocation if there is a shoulder dislocation is what you need to understand. How do you manage the fracture shown? It is a patellar fracture. It is a transverse fracture. So that is the reason tension band wiring will help you. So you should be sure. Undisplaced, displaced transverse fracture. Only lower pole or a multi segmented, fragmented, undisplaced, multi fragmented, displaced, vertical, or a osteochondral fracture. That's how you divide the petalar fracture into various kinds. So, this is an example of how a tension band wiring in a figure of eight appearance typically looks like. So, what are the various options in patellar fracture and when do you use that particular surgical option is my question. Tension band wiring, cannulated lag screw with tension band, then a very good Japanese technique called Himawari method for a comminuted patellar fracture, partial petalectomy, total petalectomy, these are all the options available whenever the patellar fracture is there. Some of you or uh, aspiring orthopedic surgeons sitting over in this August gathering. So you may become the Asia's number one knee joint surgeon, but I will have the privilege of uh, being your orthopedics teacher today night. So typically whenever tension band wiring is there, how do you want to manage? Use it. Typically, it is used for transverse patellar fracture. If there is a transverse patellar fracture, if it is undisplaced, then you put a knee brace more than enough or a knee immobilizer more than enough. It will heal. But if it is transverse and displaced, then you need to put the tension band wiring. And the whole idea is uh, you apply the K wires perpendicular to the transverse fracture. And uh, the figure of 8 tension band is applied in order to provide the compression. So the whole idea is this wire will convert the anterior distracting forces to become compressive so that that will enable the knee to continue its flexion extension activity is what need to be remembered. You have a cannulated screw with the tension band. The wires are passed through the screws and across the patella in a figure of 8 tension band. Himavari method. Himavari means sunflower in Japanese. So typically they developed this to manage a comminuted patellar fracture. And uh, the main advantage is it will bring a rigid stability, secure fixation, early recovery. So this is a classical case where a 17 year old is being hit preoperatively you have a comminuted fracture of the patella and postoperatively the Himavari method of uh, the fixation is what you are able to see. Now when do you do partial patellectomy? Suppose if it is a distal pole then the smaller fragment 
is the one which is being excites, which is called partial pedelectomy. Pedelar fractures, examiner's favorite question in the question bank. So you must be 100% sure like uh, a top orthopedic surgeon you should answer. When do you want to do a total pedelectomy? If it is a comminuted, displaced, cannot be reconstructed with the hemovary method, that becomes a total pedelectomy where you need to do and you need to reattach the petalar tendon is what you need to remember. Hina Kauser asks, what about the classes which I have missed? Oh, you have all of them uploaded into the video library in UMedico. So please uh, go back. Uh, you can call the number above me, 9000868356, WhatsApp. They will give you the subscription where you have the entire video library you can review. Uh, but every day evening, you have got a class to watch, even if you are not subscribed. But I wish a good number of you to subscribe um, so that we will also do a kind of a artificial intelligence analysis on how many topics you are left with, how many your friends are uh, doing uh, and uh, the friends with whom you played the quizzes, how are they performing compared to you. So there is a lot of excitement we can add to your preparation dynamically down the line on the UMedico app. So that the entire preparation become personalized using the artificial intelligence engine. Yeah. So which moment of the hip is the examiner trying? It is an internal rotation that he is trying to do is what you need to remember. So a patient has a low back pain, hyperpigmented nose and ears, Scobers test is positive, then what is it most likely to be? So it is a case of ochronosis. So what is Scobert's test? You will be examining how good is the ability for the person to do a flexion of the spine. A limitation of the flexion of the spine is one of the important things detected on Schober. If the person cannot be able to flex more than 5 centimeters, then that is a a uh, positive test it can occur in ankylosing spondylitis also but in view of the hyperpigmented nose and ears it is a case of alcaptenuria ochronosis is what you need to appreciate kushbu is asking what is ochronosis good question alcaptenuria may there is a deposition in uh, the homogenesic acid in uh, the various uh, um, cartilaginous tissues right now what is this phenomenon I think cheapest easiest question examiner don't want to dishearten you Chalo. Agar your preparation is nothing also still if this question you should answer right okay examiner I say 10 15 questions uh, two easy questions data hai taki he doesn't want to disappoint us ptosis 63 year old one year after the cataract surgery this is typically called after cataract, after the cataract extraction due to the um, capsule which is being left over, it become opaque. That is a underlying uh, problem. There is a corneal abrasion, foreign body, corneal ulcer, perforation, hypotonic maculopathy. What are the causes? So any uveal blood leak or a cyclodialysis or a filtration site leak can make the uvea become hypotonic called as a hypotonic maculopathy which can occur because of the um, various underlying causes like a uveal blood leak etc etc. This is called as the suprachoroidal hemorrhage what you are seeing but that won't cause any hypotonic uh, um, uh, maculopathy. So which ophthalmological investigation are you doing in this? It is a classical way tonometry by which uh, your intraocular tension is being basically tested where one strong blow of air will touch so very common investigation. Visual field defects, 
इसके बिना नीट पीजी एम्स रहेगा नहीं सो लास्ट सेशन इन पीजीए चंडीगढ़ वी डिस्कस्ड इन अ कंप्लीट डिटेल ऑन द विजुअल फील्ड इफेक्ट्स वन ऑफ द डेज इन द ऑफ्टेलमोलॉजी इफ यू मिस्ड इट प्लीज रिव्यू दैट वंस मोर ऑप्टिक चश्मा का इंटरप्शन के वजह से होने वाला हेमिनोपिया शोएब भगत एंड एवरीवन इज प्रपोजिंग बाय टेम्पोरल एब्सोल्युटली खुश हुआ मोगेम्बो at least when you attended the class after the class is over you should pick up that topic once more read in your own textbook qurana or whatever and then you should feel confident play a quiz on the u medico app on that topic in the high yield topic list that is how you should get 8 by 10 score on the u medico app quizzes on every high yield topic the moment you get it you are the ready for exam so टेम्पोरल फील्ड का रेस कम एंड फॉल ऑन द नेशनल फील्ड नेशनल रेटिना नेशनल रेटिनल फाइबर्स विल अंडर गो द डीक्यूजेशन सो एनी ऑप्टिक छायसमल लीजन लीड टू द नेशनल रेटिना ऑफ बोथ द साइट बिकम ब्लाइंड नेशनल रेटिना और basically carrying the vision on the both sides temporal areas so by temporally you become blind because of that of a lesion centrally on the optic chasm that is called by temporal hemianopia is what need to be remembered so whenever partial optic nerve is there you have a scotoma complete optic nerve you become blindness in that time optic chasm lesion will lead to both sides temporal fields gone by temporal hemianopia agar optic tract what is a tract containing ipsilateral temporal retina and contralateral nasal retina ipsilateral temporal retina has the nasal visual field of that side so that side nasal will be gone whenever optic tract is involved and the contralateral side temporal will be gone that's called the homonemous hemianopia which will happen whenever optic uh, tract is involved then mayer sloop lesion lead to development of homonemous upper quadrant anopia then optic radiation also will cause homonemous hemianopia but what is the difference between that happening due to the um lesion of the optic tract versus the optic radiation both will lead to homonemous hemianopia but the macula sparing is what you have when homonemous hemianopia occur with when there is a involvement of optic radiation similarly the visual cortex also the more peripheral the lesion more peripheral that is optic tract there is a involvement of the macula but the more and more you go towards the brain the macula sparing will be there because the macula is a special area which has its own blood supply so it's it it has its own fiber supply so there is a reason um, um, there will be a macular sparing in the homonemous hemianopias which are much more central in nature is what you need to remember then whenever bilateral macular cortex is involved that part of visual cortex going to macula central vision then bilateral central scotomas will develop is what you have to ultimately remember a five year old child gradual progressive hoarseness in voice in the last two weeks and the worsening hoarseness for three months and strider for two weeks what is the likely diagnosis so in a five year old child strider means laryngeal pathology you know wheez is because of the bronchiolar obstruction strider is because of the more upper respiratory obstruction like the larynx so there is a reason respiratory papillomatosis in the larynx is the one which you can suspect epistaxis once more aims november 2017 may which vessel is not a part of the internal carotid artery bol ke question aaya right so which is not ligated in epistaxis control you don't ligate internal carotid agar internal carotid ligate kare to pura brain will go into uh, 
फट हो जाता सो यू डोंट वॉन्ट टू डू दैट यू कैन क्लैम मैक्सिलरी आर्टरी एंट्री पॉइंट एक्सटर्नल कैरोटेड because they are the ones which are the culprits leading to the hemo uh, epistaxis what is this line called it's called ongren's line what is the importance of that typically in the head and neck tumors like maxillary tumor any antero inferior to this line there is a good prognosis for the tumor and any tumor above the ongren's has got a poor prognosis a very early extension into the eye into the skull etc etc so radiologically also the line drawn from the angle of the mandible to the medial canthus is called ongren is what need to be remembered and uh, tumors that presented above this line have got a worse prognosis you can easily remember exam hall mein tension aata upar wala बेटर है नीचे वाला बेटर है ऊपर वाला बेटर है अगर इसके ऊपर ट्यूमर आ गए तो ऊपर जाने की टाइम आ गया दैट्स व्हाट यू कैन रिमेंबर अबाउट ऑनग्रेंस लाइन व्हाट इज दिस ऑडियोग्राम विथ अ कराच नॉच क्लासिकल क्वेश्चन अबाउट ऑटोस्क्लेरोसिस वंस मोर ऑटोस्क्लेरोसिस इज अ वेरी हाई यील्ड टॉपिक इन द डेटाबेस ऑफ एग्जामिनर नाउ डॉक ए मिडिल एज लेडी केम टू द ओपीडी Direct immunofluorescence is showing a fishnet pattern of immunofluorescence. We discussed dermatology crash review for about one week. You remember? Femficus vulgaris versus Bullus femficoid. Without that, there is no question paper. Dermatology me dus ko dus mar ke ana. You should be like a American scud missile hitting on the examiner's uh, jugular. So, doctor, it is. the pemphigus vulgaris with fishnet pattern where there is a immunoglobulin g against the hemidesmosomes is what you need to remember this is the typical oral ulcers you don't have mucosal ulcers in case of bullus pemphigoid you have them in the pemphigus vulgaris and a elderly man is bullus pemphigoid a little younger person is pemphigus vulgaris what is this skin biopsy tomb stone pattern where the supradermal cells and dermal cells are disconnected from each other and within those cells they became uh, um, free from one another once more pemphigus vulgaris typically in pemphigus vulgaris all these are the necrolytic necrotic acanthalytic cells clumps of epidermal cells neutrophils and eosinophils supra basal blister is what you find and these are the basal layer and typically you can see that the row of tomb stone like appearance and uh, you can see the uh, basal cells um, they remain attached to the basement membrane but they lose the contact with their neighbors and hence they look like the row of tomb stones is what you need to remember now a young female presents with vaginal itching green frothy genital discharge and what do you see strawberry vagina so that should give you the clue of the underlying trichomonas and uh, metadazole is considered to be the treatment of choice scaly plaques itching hair loss you should immediately think of the dermatophyte infections tinea cavitis koh mount classical question 10 out of 10 marna dermatology mein nahi to dr murli bharadwaj soul will be heaving in graveyard sorrowfully a young girl presented in the opd patchy loss of the hair no scarring so it is not alopecia scarring alopecia no erythema young girl you should think of trichotillomania they they keep pulling the hair 12 year old boy four hypopigmented patches on the back and the left arm there's a loss of sensation multi basilary leprosy 
डॉक्टरोलॉजी का टॉप ट्वेंटी टॉपिक्स क्या है आप हाई टॉपिक लिस्ट में देख लीजिए लेप्रेसी इनवेरिएबली विल बी द फोर्थ और फिफ्थ हाई टॉपिक विदाउट दट देर इज नो क्वेश्चन पेपर राइट सो सी डी आर क्लोफेजमीन डैपसोन रिफैमसिन सो यू शुड बी श्योर रिफैमसिन सिक्स हंड्रेड एम जी वंस मंथली डैपसोन हंड्रेड एम जी डेली क्लोफेजमीन थ्री हंड्रेड एम जी वंस मंथली एंड क्लोफेजमीन थ्री एम जी डेली This is considered with the regime completion of 12 monthly plan in case of uh, um, multi bacillary. Whereas in posi bacillary, only rifampicin and dapsin. Rifampicin 600 mg once monthly, dapsin 100 mg daily, and completion of six monthly is considered to be the thing that you need to remember. Once more, what are the doses in children? Also, you must be sure. and what is that you give in multi drug therapy regime for children under 10 years what is the dosages you should be very very sure about what is this condition where you find this congenital lesion on the face this is a bmw question but was mad and waste this won't repeat common sense hai to koshish karo congenital melanocytic nevus Malignant melanoma only 90% medical students even one case nahi dekhte. Where is melanocytic nevus? Too academic. 11 year old. This you have to answer. Agar isko wrong kare to 10,000 students will cross your head. It will be like a bahu bali war. Need PG. So itchy, hyper pigmented plaques in the cubital, popliteal. classical of atopic dermatitis is what you need to remember what is this needle lp needle lumbar puncture needle so it is done in the lateral recumbent position the bevel of the needle will be facing upwards and the breath holding is not required and coagulopathy is a absolute contraindication is what you have to be doubly sure about so the spinal needle that you use usually is a 22 gauze and uh, 1.5 inches for less than 1 year 2.5 for 1 year to middle childhood so you should be doubly sure and how you basically pass the needle unless you have done a lp yourself as a house surgeon any amount of reading is uh, not enough still if you didn't get a chance don't worry uh go and do one night duty in a neurology ward your uh, senior resident will give you 10 cases for you to do one ek ke baad ek uh, the lumbar puncture hmm? now there's a complex renal cyst which was detected incidentally on the ultrasound and what is the most likely possibility in this given patient of this uh, renal cyst He was asymptomatic. Went for insurance policy and then uh, found it. It is a angiomyolipoma. Angiomyolipomas can be sporadic or tuberous sclerosis. May you will find them. Tuberous sclerosis. May. Usually due to a mutation. The tuberous tuberous sclerosis gene TSC1 is hemartin. TSC2 is tuberin. They form a protein complex and that lead to the um tumor suppressor gene any mutation in this tumor suppressor gene lead to development of angiomyolipoma one single bullet you need to remember is a uh, tuberous sclerosis uh, and angiomyolipoma so what is angiomyolipoma fat blood vessels smooth muscles is what you find and if generally asymptomatic but symptomatic flank pain and mass effect will be there and uh, it can be 60% of times symptomatic with anemia hypertension flank pain palpable mass etc etc now a 65 year old male banker and uh, in the right kidney there is a complex cyst and the ct scan was given to you and uh, 
any complex cyst in the CT, in the kidney, should then make you to think of uh, a renal cell carcinoma. So this is called a multilocular cystic renal cell carcinoma is what you have to basically remember. A young female, renal calculi, bone pain, abdominal cramps, parathormone levels are raised. So how do you identify parathyroid adenoma, most common cause for the hyperparathyroidism? So if you do a systemic scan, this is how a adenoma, the submandibular glands and a adenoma typically become detectable in the parathyroids. So this is the thyroid and this is the parathyroid, the superior and inferior. In that inferior parathyroid is having the adenoma is what you are able to detect. A patient with a pain abdomen for two hours presents to the casualty. You can see here in the diaphragm, subdiaphragmatically there is an air between the right hemidiaphragm and the liver. That shows that there is a pneumoperitoneum. So there are certain signs of pneumoperitoneum. Whenever air releases into the peritoneal space, if you take a plain radiograph, it makes a lot of structures of the abdomen to become visible like a shadow. Shadows never lie. That is all the radiology. So in supine position, you can see a linear shape. That's called liver sign of pneumoperitoneum. Then you can find a Morrison's pouch, a free gas can be identified. Then air can be found anterior to the ventral surface area whenever pneumoperitoneum is there. Regular sign is the bowel wall become outlined by both the intraluminal and extraluminal air. Then if you paint the patient to lie down in the left lateral decubitus position, then you can be able to say the air between the abdominal wall and the liver is, uh, if you lie down on the left lateral position, your right side will go up between the abdominal wall and the liver, you can find the air, which is called decubitus abdominal sign. Then the falciform ligament can become very prominent with the air surrounding it. This is called football sign. The massively air filled peritoneum looks like a American baseball kind of a shape. Then continuous diaphragm. If you look at the two heavy diaphragms, below that the air will create a continuous diaphragm sign. Then double bubble sign. There is an air in the stomach and below the stomach margin also you have an air uh, which is called a double bubble sign in pneumoperitoneum. Then this is called a cupola sign where air accumulation under the central tendon of the diaphragm and even the lesser sac can show the presence of the air um, and this is called a triangle sign where there is uh, a gas between the large bubble and the flank. And there can be um, uh, typical bubbles of gas uh, called abscess gas sign. So these are the various uh, locations where the air in the abdomen will bring out that uh, structures which are in front of it become visible on a plain radiograph that makes the pneumoperitoneum. Don't remember all these signs. I'm just adding you. So that you will remember where to look for the air in the abdomen and detect the pneumoperitoneum. It is not that you need to remember all these signs. Just x-ray is being shown to you. The right atrium looks significantly enlarged. It is out from the midline. And the pulmonary vascular pedicle is thinned out. And there is a... Um, right atrial enlargement, narrow vascular pedicle and a decreased pulmonary blood flow. So this is how a right atrial enlargement can present itself. So what makes the right atrial pressure to elevate? 
any elevation of right ventricular pressure can lead to an increase in the back pressure in the right atrium which can lead to the right atrial enlargement to happen. What makes right ventricular pressure high? Any pulmonary hypertension cord pulmonale can lead to that. Similarly, right atrioventricular valve is tricuspid. Any tricuspid regurgitation or stenosis or Epstein's anomaly can lead to the development of the right atrial enlargement. Similarly, whenever ASD is there, from the left atrium, blood will move into the right atrium. Right atrium get the regular blood flow. Too much of blood flow in the right atrium lead to right atrial enlargement. Any atrial fibrillation, dilated cardiomyopathy, various reasons. So whenever right atrium become enlarged, the heart become globular, the pulmonary vessel become not, um, pulmonary um, vascular tree become narrow. So that is, they are the classical features. Which mood stabilizer has an anti-suicidal effect is my question to all of you. Lithium, once more, just like TB. Lithium agar options mein hai to, fluoxetine agar options mein hai to, examiner is trying to hold your hand and asking you, put that as an answer. Though you don't know anything about them. Better know something about them. Lithium and fluoxetine, invariably high yield questions. Oh, options mein hai to, they are the answer. So lithium has a serotonin effect. And it protects the brain from the glutamate induced cell death. It has an anti suicidal effect. What is the therapeutic window of lithium? Favorite question 0.6 to 1.2 milliequivalents per liter. Don't forget this numerical. More than 3.5 is fatal. Lithium can lead to hypothyroidism, renal insufficiency, two important side effects. Then what increase lithium, what decrease lithium? NSIs, ACE inhibitors, thiazides, tetracycline, salt restriction. Increase the lithium levels. Theophylline, caffeine, osmotic diuretics. Decrease the lithium levels. And you can use the lithium. Um, uh, you, I mean, when lithium leads to the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, you can use the potassium sparing diuretics to treat the Nephrogenic diabetes insipidus caused by the lithium. Lithium will make the tubules become resistant to the action of the antidiuretic hormone. Then it is a pregnancy class D drug. If a woman is receiving lithium and become pregnant, Epstein's anomaly is guaranteed. So that's what you need to remember. A state of mutism, a kinesis. Baat nahi kar sakta. But the patient is aware of his surroundings and somewhat alert. What is that called as? Beautiful question. It is called stupor. That is the definition of a stupor. So what is a twilight state? It is a well-defined interruption of the continuity of the consciousness. And... The restriction um, of a morbidly changed behavior and relatively well-oriented behavior and abrupt onset, variable duration and there can be occurrence of unexpected violent acts or emotional bursts. Suddenly, otherwise he is normal. Usko bolte hai twilight state. Some of our classmates in reading room will be in twilight states. Normally, Reta. Usko unnecessarily disturb mat karo. Pagal hoke, he will bite you. Once more, he will be studying and underlining the horizon. So, twilight state violence say, be careful. Hmm? What is dreamlike state? Another classmate of us will be in the oneroid state in the reading room. So, the patient appears to be in a dream world. Don't disturb his dream. And uh, you need to look for the other symptoms before you define on a roid state. So fugue means all of you know very well. Fugue is memory loss. It's also called psychogenic amnesia. The people will travel many miles together without knowing what they are and forget. And one day they may suddenly reappear. 
lot of movies were taken on the base of the fugue. But what is the definition of delirium? What are the criteria of delirium is a very important question. Fluctuating course, altered consciousness, inattention, disorganized thinking, excessive psychomotor activity like a delirious person will be running and disturbance of the sleep-wake cycle defines delirium. Lastly, for this wonderful evening with all of you guys, wishing you all a happy Diwali and 2019 will be your year of junior residency of doing the MD and MS. 20 year old female cutting her fingers. She is having thoughts of cutting her fingers. She plans and imagines doing it but never does it. She says she is not even having any guilty of such a thought. And also says that those thoughts are very distressing. And um, whenever the seizure is there or automatically they subside by own or at the time of seizure, end of the seizure. So what is that called as? It is called forced thinking is what you need to remember where there is a psychic aura in case of the frontal lobe seizures where there is a recurrent intrusive thoughts or an ideas to injure oneself is what you need to remember. So dear all, thank you for a wonderful evening and making me a student every day. The great chance you have given me to be with all of you. That's the happiest moment for me. And enjoy a night, uh, a night of a light festival. And uh, come back day after tomorrow evening once more at 5 p.m. Aapke saath, Dr. Murli Bharadwaj, forever until you get the seat. That is our uh, deal between both of us. And uh, you're all sure that you're going to make it uh, the next 60 days or 50 days left over. A very fruitful time in preparation for NEET PG. Forget about all what happened in the past. Start another 50 days. Diwali to need PG 2019, you should work like an atom bomb. Thank you. Good night.